Hello, everybody. It's a pleasure for me to be here. Thank you, Jan, for the nice invitation and the, the opportunity to be here and speak a little bit about this uh, Montreux Jazz digital project. Uh, you see here in the title, uh, from a collection to an innovation platform. So uh, we have this, uh, all those beautiful recordings from the festival and uh, we were lucky at EPFL to be able to digitize this, preserve and use it for innovation and for the researchers. So I will explain a little bit how this happened and how actually uh, innovation helped a lot in digitizing this, uh, this collection. Uh, I will start uh, with uh, a little bit of history about the festival and uh, how this archive was built actually and why. And then I'll move to the, to the idea of the Montreux Jazz Digital Project. And I'll speak a little bit about the work we did in archiving before going to the innovation project to show you a little bit the dynamic of the, of the project. Uh, in the end, I'll speak about uh, yeah, uh, one of the projects we have in, uh, recently in open science uh, to build an interface for the, all the researchers from all around the world, actually, to be able to use this archive and uh, uh, do research on, on that. And we'll end with a discussion, of course. So you probably heard about the Montreux Jazz Festival. It was created in 1967 by a guy who had a vision, really, Claude Knops. Uh, he wanted to record the festival from the beginning in video, which was really unusual at that time, and recording everything in the best quality, both for an audio archive and a video archive. And why, actually, this? So I, I have to go back to uh, 1850, where uh, Montreux was uh, really uh, just a, a, a gathering a few villages, a few villages in fields and with wine, vineyards. And uh, actually, there were two young writers who knew the place and wrote books on uh, where the stories were happening at that location. The first one uh, is Jean-Jacques Rousseau, who wrote La Nouvelle Héloïse, and the second one is Lord Byron with The Prisoner of Chillon. And those two books did a buzz in the whole Europe, actually, and many people wanted to come uh, and see what happened and how was this beautiful place uh, from the books. So many people came with the whole family to spend the whole summer with maybe 30 persons during three months. It was not easy at that time to travel, so it was a kind of uh, adventure. And uh, rapidly the, the people in Montreux realized that, okay, maybe we need to do a business with that. And so the welcome came uh, very important. They uh, decided to try and keep the tourists for the winter. So immediately, in addition to welcome, technology came over to Montreux. With first, the first teleski in Switzerland was above uh, Montreux. Then the longest uh, bobsleigh run was uh, constructed there. The steepest cable car with an engineer having to prove to the population that uh, his system was, uh, was safe. So going down uh, the rail tracks only using the brakes uh, with all the populations below looking at that. So uh, that's the, the, the story of Montreux. It's really a mix between welcome and technology. There were a lot of festival happenings or uh, conference uh, happening in Montreux, like the Rose d'Or, like the TV symposium, and, uh, and then the festival. So the festival actually was a kind of follow-up of that. And when you, you, if you see on these slides, it's about quality, technology. Uh, you see here on the top right the, uh, the wonderful room that Claude Knobs had built in his chalet uh, on top of Montreux to show this archive to the, to the artists. And of course, the, the technology, he wanted to record everything always with the, the state-of-the-art equipment. Typically, HD came already in 1991, which is 15 years before the, the public had access to that. And uh, yeah, so that's the story. 
You see here technology and welcome. And again, one of the track was to, to really welcome the artists as friends. And he uh, acquired a chalet on top of Montreux where all those artists could come and spend some days and meet others, organize jam sessions in the gardens. And they would know that they will live with a tape uh, freely, by the way, Claude was there, take the tape and you can do what you, what you want. And they could publish records and later on DVDs uh, with that. So that was the, the, the culture, you see the view from, from above Montreux here. Uh, Claude was helped as well, in, um, uh, thanks of specific uh, things that happened in Montreux. The first one is in 1969, where suddenly in the, in the festival, in the program, an artist is missing. And uh, Claude doesn't know what to do. He asks the two artists which were playing, who were playing before and after, please go on stage, improvise something. This was Eddie Harris and Liz McCann, and they, they played a wonderful performance in the room. Uh, the head of the, the Atlantic record in the US uh, said, we want to do a record of that, and Claude said, okay, but with live at Montreux on the sides, both sides of the, of the records. And it became a number one during four months in the world jazz clubs in the US, making the festival known uh, in that part of the, of the world. The other event, you know it probably through uh, Deep Purple, it's, uh, it's a, a concert organized uh, in December, so it was not the festival, it was part of the Super Pop Montreux, where Pink Floyd came, uh, uh, Rolling Stones as well, and that day it was Frank Zappa. And in the public, there is a guy who sent a rocket uh, to the ceiling, uh, maybe a little bit too enthusiastic, and the ceiling was done of paper and bamboo. So it starts burning, and many people at the beginning look, just look at that for a few minutes, and, uh, and then it's too late, and uh, the casino is, in the end, totally destroyed. Uh, and, uh, yeah, that day, uh, Deep Purple uh, were present, and a few days after, uh, they come with a, with a small cassette to, to, to Claude. We are so disappointed. Um, here is a song for you. And uh, Claude will listen to the song and say, that will not only for me, be for me, uh, please put it on the, on the next record. And uh, it was Smoke on the Water, which tells the story of, the, of this event. So that was a little bit the, 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 the story who brought the festival to, to its level. So actually, uh, when we started digitization, uh, we had a few contacts with artists. Quincy Jones, as you see, said it's the most important testimonial to the, the history of music, covering jazz, blues, and rock, but not only, of course, all the, all the styles. Uh, we call this festival Montreux Jazz, but it's actually everything. And we have started this digitization project in 2007. A foundation was created, the Claude Knobs Foundation, and the collection was registered at UNESCO in 2013 in the Memory of the World program. It was the first audio uh, visual library uh, recorded. Uh, a few numbers about this archive. You see here the, the 14,000 tapes. And maybe uh, another story which is interesting, uh, because uh, the, all the archive was produced by the Swiss television at the beginning and for many, many years, still now. And the tapes were kept uh, at the television. Uh, and suddenly, one day in 1987, Claude Knobs needs a tape from Aretha Franklin, uh, the concert of 71, and he wants to publish something. So he asked the television, can you please uh, give me the tape? And they said, no, sorry, we don't have it. Oh, you're joking, I, I know that we, we, we have recorded the, the concert, so we will come and, and, and try and find it. And it was one of those two-inch tapes from the 60s, they search for a while and then f they find it. Uh, but uh, it was, of course, Aretha Franklin 71, a big red line on it, football match, uh, Reed, Iserab, two small villages in Valis, and, uh, and actually they, uh, the television, because of uh, reduction in budget, was w w w reusing old tapes. So it was a difficult time, but Claude Knobs decided to acquire all the tapes. And this bad even actually become positive with the years because 
Afterwards, uh, he built a kind of uh, bunker, a very well uh, equipped room to keep the tapes for 30 and now 40 uh, years. So the status now that we found on the, on the tapes were, was very good. And since he was only trying the newest technology, uh, he had several copies in different formats of all the tapes. So we still have the Aretha Franklin uh, concert, by chance. Uh, yeah, I, I forgot to, to mention. So you see all the different formats that took place along those 50 years are, are gathered in this archive, 18 different formats on audio in multi-tracks. From 1973, we, we have the multi-tracks. Uh, we have uh, 11,000 hours of video, while the number of hours of concert is 5,000, so you see that it's more than twice the, the number of concert hours, in audio 6,000. A lot of pictures. Uh, we started with one photographer. You see here some examples. George Braunschweig, he covered the whole festival from 69, still now in activity. And we could digitize his collection to go together with the, uh, with the audiovisual archive. You see here the, uh, the organi organization of the, of the archive all through the years with all those overlaps between the, the different format and different years. Uh, you see that in 91, there was the, the three first years of HD recorded on, on one inch tape uh, that were later on moved to, to HD cam. And in audio, it's pretty much the same. Uh, with now the, the multi-track sessions directly uh, gathered digitally. Uh, here you see uh, the compactus, as we say in French, uh, uh, holding the archive in the, in the chalet. So let's move on now to the, to the idea of this Montreux Jazz Digital Project. It was a meeting, actually, between the, the former president of EPFL, the school, Patrick Ebicher, and Claude Nobbs, and they, uh, they met at the chalet, and of course Claude showed all this archive, and Patrick Ebicher, who is, uh, likes a lot music and is very close to, to art, uh, imme immediately realized that it was a very important uh, heritage to preserve. And his first question was, do you have a copy of that? No. Uh, so you should do something, because you cannot afford losing that kind of, uh, of collection. And, uh, but we don't have money. Uh, maybe we can help. And that was really the, the starting point. Patrick Ebicher had a lot of vision as well, so the two of them together, uh, the ideas were, were very promising. And the concept was for EPFL to take care about founding and digitization of this collection. And then, uh, as a counterpart, being able to use all the digitized content for research in acoustics, signal processing, image processing, but as well design architecture to build uh, places for the public to, to see that, neuroscience, uh, musicology, museology, and a lot of new things. Now we work with more than 15 labs at EPFL, not only at EPFL, by the way, and more than uh, 10 startups involved as well, and, and more and more, actually. So really, the concept, digitize and preserve, one of the role, the main role at EPFL uh, uh, on the operational side of things, and then innovate and research. Uh, the first issue was to find, uh, to, to found actually the, the project. And at the beginning, they were trying uh, using European uh, project for research, but it didn't work because there, there, there was too many operational costs on that. So they started with, uh, they, they tried a startup. But because one of the startup in Switzerland was interested, we can digitize two years. And then we have a good demonstrator for our technology. Uh, but then they came and they said, OK, now we've done two years. We have our demonstrator. We can go on, but uh, we'll have to, you'll have to pay us. And by the way, we've used our IP for the different modules. And uh, stop. This is not possible. We want something open. And the public funding was not possible because this archive is private, considered as private. And in the end, uh, we were lucky to find a watchmaker in Switzerland, Audemars Piguet, who gave us the first uh, millions of Swiss francs to, to start. And then there were many others, 
uh, to help. Uh, so it was in, finally in 2010 that the center was created, Metamedia, uh, because of the meta importance of metadata, and we grown up to about 20, 12 people in 2016 when the, the digitization was nearly over. And we opened the Montreux Jazz Café on the campus to display uh, the archive to, to the public. We have more than yeah, 150 is growing every, every, every month using that, especially now with a lot of projects in, in machine learning, typically. So, uh, of course, on, on the digitization side, we had to go through all the, the usual tasks, inventory, quality control, uh, documentation, storage. We didn't digitize things by, our, by ourselves, uh, of course. We delegated that to specialized uh, companies. And uh, the collaboration was at first between EPFL and between Montreux Sounds, the company owning the, uh, the archive, uh, which then, uh, after the UNESCO uh, registration, became the, the Clonops Foundation. And you see here the mission, uh, the vision of the Clonops Foundation to make accessible the Montreux Jazz Archive uh, to the largest number for uh, research, education, always in respect of the author's rights. And that's the point, uh, which is interesting now. Author's rights, how did we manage that? Uh, the festival signs contracts, of course, for every concert with the artists. In those contracts, uh, they agree for some promotional use for the festival. They can use maybe three songs of it for in each concert to show in the Montreux Jazz Café. They can use the whole concert during six months on television that kind of things. So based on that, this allows us to show a bit of the, of the result of this work. Especially, and that's the reason for this idea, to build a Montreux Jazz Café on the campus. Because having this Montreux Jazz Café can allow us to, to exploit those, uh, those promotion rights. And secondly, in Switzerland, we have an, an exception on author's rights for education and research. Uh, so that's why we could use every, every sample of the archive for research or for uh, classrooms, but not to show on the web and not to show to the public. So this Montreux Jazz Café was a way to show something, but still we have this issue. Uh, we cannot put it online. Uh, Claude Knobs would have liked that, uh, but it's not possible. For now, it's not possible. It would be uh, as expensive to, to check all the rights with all the musicians uh, than uh, doing this, uh, the whole digitization work, actually. So it's a problem of, uh, of investment. Uh, a few images now about uh, the archiving. You see here the, some samples of two inch tapes about to leave for, the, uh, for digitization in, in the partner. Uh, inventory task, we had a, a kind of reference key for every concert uh, with the year, the room, the format, that kind of things. Uh, we've been working on a big metadata database to gather all this information, including the rights, because if we have platforms to show the archive at the festival, in the Montreux Jazz Café, in a museum, we should check that it's allowed for every single song. So we have modeled, digitized the, the, the contracts and modeled this in the, in the database. Uh, digitization was the performed in uncompressed, uh, so in the best quality that we can have for long-term preservation uh, with different uh, modes. Of course, the uncompressed reference format and then a broadcast format and then some uh, other uh, sub-format to show this to the, to the public. A lot of uh, process regarding the, the acquisition, uh, the quality control. The same for HD. By the way, HD, we decided to move on with uncompressed. It's uh, more than 500 gigs per hour of concert, so it's a lot. Up to now, we, can, we, we, we kept this view uh, to check for the, for the future. Uh, and yeah, some of the, of the process. Quality control was very important, of course, because we wanted to check that uh, the result first, the result of the, of the digitization was correct, and then identify where we had problem originally already in the recordings. 
So we had many students and uh, specially trained people working and looking at that con those concerts for hours. We didn't perform a continuous check, but for every file we were uh, spending a, typically 15 minutes to check at different places uh, in the concert. You see here the, uh, the workstations to, to do that. And again, some, uh, some ingestion. So uh, storage was performed originally uh, very, very uh, traditionally on two sets of LTO tapes. We started with LTO4, we are now uh, on LTO6 and we need to move on. And in parallel, a third copy of the archive uh, could be stored on a, on a big uh, object storage system, and it was one of the first collaborations we had with a, with a partner. It was in Belgium, a startup company in 2011, coming up with a, a new type of object storage and very adapted for large files. We, so they, they gave us one petabyte of storage in exchange uh, with the messages and just the communication. We store the Motor Jazz Festival archive. So we went uh, for a road uh, trip in, uh, with press release in the US to promote this. And as a counterpart, we could really work comfortably, not with the uncompressed format, because it was too big for, for one petabyte, but with the second uh, broadcast format. And we could run all the quality control, all the, the indexing uh, very, very uh, nicely on uh, using this device. In uh, 2013, we had a second petabyte coming and we installed it in the infrastructure of the Congress House in Montreux. The, both of them were linked with uh, optical fiber and it was very interesting for us because it, could, it allowed to really perform some kind of live archiving just after the concert, the file was uh, placed on the archive and available at EPFL. So it gave us uh, ideas. Uh, yeah, you, you see here the, uh, the interface that we had to build to communicate with this uh, uh, S3 object-based storage um, to make the transfer very efficient. Uh, but the, the funny part about this, uh, those two systems, one in Montreux, one in PFL, at EPFL, was that we could immediately organize an indexing the, the, during the, the day following uh, the concert. During the night, we could even transcode already. And uh, you see here the, the team, uh, we, have, we had more than 60 stu students working on indexing uh, of every file, cutting the, the file correctly, checking the set list. And in the end, the day after the concert, we had our first platforms for the public installed in the festival, so all the old archive was there, but in addition, we could show the concert of the day before. And uh, this kind of live archiving action was really, really uh, interesting for us, and especially in 2015, when this company, AmpliData, providing the storage, was acquired by Western Digital. Uh, it was more difficult for us at that time because such a giant as Western Digital probably would not be interested to move on with uh, supporting us. But when we, we told them this story, and we were lucky to have one of the vice president coming in, in Switzerland at the Montreux Jazz Festival, they said it's, it's really cool because we can show that our systems can be used really live to exploit the data. So from that time, 2015, we could move on with the collaboration with Western Digital. And uh, here you see the, uh, yeah, what I just mentioned, actually, with the, with the booth we had at the festival to show the archive to, to the public. And uh, the new storage, uh, which is now Active Archive, and we still work with that, it's now for the, the last four years that we have this active archive. We have three different modules now. Every one is 4.7 petabytes, and it's uh, distributed. There is a good level of redundancy. And I think this is a very nice option to have still the two sets of LTO, which are very important to preserve, uh, but are more considered as a backup for now. And this one to really work every day with the, with the content. And when we have to move on from one to, to a new generation of LTO, those devices are very, uh, very appropriate because we can just copy from them to build the new, new generations of, uh, of LTO. 
Okay, so um, let's move on. Let's move on now to the to the valorization. Uh, a first example uh, to give you here. You see this uh, slide. It's in the Montreux Jazz Festival in 2014. For one of the first years, we are there to propose the first results of digitization to the public. And uh, we decide to work with the Acoustic Lab of EPFL to uh, design a kind of sound projector. You see it on the, on the roof, there are several of them. Combined with the iPads to show the archive, they can project the sound just over a group of three or four people, and they can select their songs and listen to that. And three meters away, you have another group of people uh, who is listening to other, other songs and they do not disturb uh, one, uh, one another. Uh, this, was, this is typically the idea of this project and the innovation around the archive. You see, this is an example which is not directly linked to the archive. We use here the Montreux Jazz Festival archive and the event to uh, first design a new concept because in that case, if the festival would have not happened, the team would have not worked that much to produce that. And then, of course, to be able to show it and promote it to the, to the public. So it's in that way that those, um, those archives are interesting as well for the, for the EPFL. And I have a small movie from the startup that uh, commercialized later on those sound dots. That's the name we gave to that uh, projector. Hydex is a young Swiss company based in Lausanne. We are a team of experts in acoustics and audio signal processing, and we are developing highly directive sound systems. We are used to present our products as sonic umbrellas. Suspended from the ceiling, each box directs music down, so that when you are placed below, you are totally immersed in your musical ambience, and without disturbing the neighborhood. Our products are dedicated to markets of museums, horeca, trade shows, fitness, or spas, and more generally to anyone interested in diffusing localized sound in order, for example, to create uh, multiple soundscapes in the same venue. Okay, so just to let you feel the efficiency of the system, I'm now placed uh, two meters in front of the box and I'm going to go below. And you hear the sound. And here you're listening almost nothing. So you, you see the, the interest and the, the passion as well of the, of the students with that. Another project we had was related to the casino that burned, uh, the, the Casino Cursal. You see here a picture with, by the way, Claude Knobs here, uh, trying to, uh, to uh, stop the fire. Why don't we model the casino uh, venue uh, geometrically and acoustically using 3D audio. And then we could replace uh, a, a visitor in the, in the hall and looking and listening to one of the concerts. So that was the idea of a team of researchers. I think I will move to the, you see the place where we, the, the, the setup we built for the visitors to look at that. And actually it was very simple, there was a video and uh, the video was taking you flying over the public in the Montreux Jazz uh, uh, Hall, and you would, uh, the, the acoustic was following. So you would start from the rear with a lot of reverb, and then in the end you reach stage and you have the drums just next to your ears. And it was really, really uh, an intensive uh, and emotional experience. I will let the, the researchers explain as well. On December 4th in 1971, the legendary Casino of Montreux burnt down during a concert by Frank Zappa after an over-enthusiastic fan fired off a flare 
that set fire to the ceiling. So we saw the little fire. We didn't think it was that important, really. And some of the people that were around that saw this little fire. They thought it was maybe another show or something, you know. And, um, and then it became a bit more uh, peculiar, in particular when the light went off. The casino, a cultural icon of Switzerland and the home of famous artists such as Aretha Franklin, seemed to be lost forever. Until today. I remember when I got first hands on the Montreal Jazz Archive, I was like, wow, that's an impressive collection of music. It's so many outstanding performances and I mean, go figure, it's 40 years of recording and, and they always used the best technique that were available at that time, right? So. Then I came across this gig by Aretha Franklin and it was taken in 1971. And then this idea popped up and I was like, why don't we just resurrect this, this old venue, this glorious place where so many great artists already performed. And I mean, we have the technology and we have the Montreal Jazz Archive. And so the project was born. By analyzing books, photographs, videos, recordings and accounts of eyewitnesses, the researchers managed to gather enough information on the casino's architecture and atmosphere for a realistic virtual reconstruction. The high-class visual rendering was done by the renowned atelier Feuerrot, who managed to revive the casino's dense live atmosphere in an impressive way. Well, uh, I would say the hourglass is the, is the heart of this, uh, of this project and it was also the heart of the building also because it was in the center of the, of the, one, uh, of the one hall called the Sablier. Um, we were going through, the, through this one video, I think it was the Aretha Franklin um, concert, and um, just, I think it was 10 to 12 seconds before the end of the video, there was a very brief um, light flash from some photographer in the audience. And uh, exactly in this tenth of a second, we paused it. And uh, this is basically the only frame in which you can see this hourglass. So Authentic room acoustics of the casino were recreated by using the innovative real-time simulation software Reflector, developed by the emerging company Audioborn. As quick as a flash, Reflector computes the accurate directions along which sound travels through a room and renders high-quality 3D audio in an authentic and enveloping way. So by using this technology and in combination with the Montreal Jazz Archive. What we create in the end is a time travel back to the 70s. So you are there again, not physically, but virtually. And you attend the concerts. You attend Aretha Franklin's gig again. And it doesn't feel like you're watching it on TV. It feels like you are there again. In a final step, the researchers designed an audiovisual installation featuring a high-end 17-channel loudspeaker system to give everyone the opportunity to relive the uniqueness of the casino after 43 years of deprivation. Another example, there are, there are many of them. Uh, I can, uh, yeah, you see here uh, one of the, the application using the multi-tracks where we built with future instruments uh, a kind of 
uh, interface where you can play and remix the, the concert from, from the, the multi-tracks. You see the, the concept. Uh, we organized several times with the festival uh, an event in Paris, for example, again, reconstructing from the multi-tracks a concert, but forgetting one of the instruments. And then we invite an artist to play live this instrument in front of the video. And uh, it's, a, it's a very nice uh, experience as well. This is Anna Aron, who uh, was singing instead of P.J. Harvey. VR, of course, is uh, one of the, the most interesting things now. Uh, we came up with um, recordings using 360 cameras uh, that we placed on stage during the concert. And uh, we joined this with 3D audio. Uh, we had uh, uh, sound engineers mixing uh, in the backstage for the place where we had uh, the camera. Uh, and then people could really wear the glasses and feel on stage uh, with the artist, B.B. King there, uh, the drummer there, the public in front. And uh, we did that first time in 2016, then in 2018 in live. It was really impressive to have this work, these things live. Thanks to a team from University of Tsinghua, we could have uh, stitching algorithms working in live. And uh, the people could really feel on stage, but, but really at the same time as the artists uh, were, were playing. Uh, the booth was uh, this one on the, uh, in, the, in the festival venue. And you see Charles Bradley here. Discovering his concert just yes, afterwards. Yes. I don't believe it. In backstage. Oh my god. <laughs> <laughs> and I walk up the stage. <laughs> oh, I get what I mean. <laughs> so you this is one way for the future to have the interest as well from the artist to keep on being recorded because it's more and more difficult now. Uh, to have their agreement uh, with the new situation of the music industry. Uh, just to mention a few projects to detect and correct some defects on, uh, on standard definition video. Super resolution, we have this whole collection in SD and we have the second part of the archive in HD. So when we are in a room to discover all that, it's, uh, we are sometimes disappointed when, when we move back in time. So why not trying to improve this uh, quality using machine learning, modeling what is a beautiful image and applying those models to the, to the old archive. We did uh, automatic thumbnail generation as well with aesthetical criteria uh, used in the at training time. Um, we have 49,000 49, uh, songs in the festival, so if we want to generate this manually, it's not easy. Uh, a signal processing lab uh, came up with, uh, with this uh, Montre Jazz Artist Galaxy. Every point is an artist taken out of the database, the metadata database. Every point is an artist, and if two musicians play together at the festival, the two points are linked. So you have on the board uh, the, the groups, the bands that played alone, and at the center you have the, all the stars who played with many, many others, came 30 times. B.B. Uh, King, for example, is in yellow here, and Santana, and uh, George Duke in orange. We designed as well, as I was telling before, with a lab of design, another one of architecture, some uh, platforms for the public to discover the archive in an immersive way. This was the first one, the cocoon, designed by this uh, EPFL ECAL lab. Uh, you see here the interface inside. Uh, and then the second generation, which is available in, in the Montreux Jazz Café for more people, maybe groups of 20 persons, and this is really our main platform in the Montreux Jazz Café for uh, public access to, to the, the archive. Recently, a prototype was built. You see even it running here. It's a car, a smart. They destroyed the glass and replaced by a screen. Here it's entering into the chalet of Claude Nobs. It was the prototype in 2016. And uh, of course, we are not allowed to, to drive with that, but there is a camera in front. <laughs> and uh, yeah, 
two year from uh, two years ago, we can show that uh, as a, as a platform inside the festival for people to discover the the archive. It's called Nina, by the way. <laughs> Uh, and recently, we have the dome, uh, which was designed by a new professor at EPFL, Sarah Kenderdine. And uh, here, the concept is to uh, show uh, first a network of the artists who came to Montreux. In the, you see that kind of, uh, of network. It's the relations between the artists, which is uh, expressed. And then you can select. Uh, which artists you want, and you have the songs that can be displayed in the in the ceiling. Uh, it's good for interaction as well because there is on, there is only one device to run the thing, and uh, yeah. So this is one of the latest platform. We hope to bring it to the festival next year, but it's a large one, so we we are in discussion to see if we find the the, the room. Uh, so you see some examples of what I just mentioned in terms of innovation. We have more to process, detection of the solo, detection of emotion, artist recognition, many things. And uh, again, uh, we have the opportunity to show this archive in the Montreal Café and at the festival every year. You see here the booth we had. We started another type of project, not technological, but more in the sociology and uh, um, Social and human science, trying to understand what was the, the trick about this festival, why so many people came at the festival, wanted to work as staff from generations to generations, and what is finally the memory, what will be the memory of this festival, how many people find their job thanks to this event, how many find their uh, husbands, wives, how many babies. So we have a Montreux Jazz uh, Memories platform that was opened uh, one year ago uh, to start those kind of projects in, uh, in social science. We did a lot of interview, either from the staff or from the, the people close to the, to the festival. A few pictures, the booth on VR here, and the Montreux Jazz Café. So, of course, you are welcome if you are around in Switzerland to, to come and, and look at the, the content there. We have those kind of platforms, very simple as well, that we can show in the musical schools uh, as well, or a different opportunity to, to navigate in the, in the archive. To get to the end, the preservation now, uh, I, I would say as a conclusion, we had a, a really comfortable situation to digitize and to work in innovation with this, uh, with this, uh, this project. Now we have a challenge to preserve it long term. Because we had private foundings, it works well locally in time. But as soon as we, as we, we were mentioning before, we want to uh, make things uh, solid for the next uh, 10 years. It's difficult. Uh, a company, a private company, will not invest for 10 years. So we have to move more to, toward public institutions. But in Switzerland, for now, it's not possible because this archive is considered as, as private. So they cannot help. But there is a strategy to move on in that direction. In the meantime, uh, we have to stick to our short view and again innovation helps us a lot because we have more and more projects in innovation we can take some money on those projects to found all the people who work on maintaining the, the database and really the, the basic things. I will not say too much about DNA storage because Bill is here and he will talk about that tomorrow. We have encoded two songs uh, of the Montreux Jazz Festival already on DNA thanks to Twist Bioscience. So, I think I will, I will stop here. And uh, on uh, Deep Purple, thank you for your attention. So much. I guess there will be questions from the room. Anyone? 
Yeah. Uh, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Well, with the older tapes, the old two-inch um, yes. tapes, um, how fast are they degrading? Have you got any that are starting to show problems? And have you had to go back and re-digitise any as better equipment comes along for digitising that You mean the two-inch tapes? Yeah. We were surprised by the, the very good quality, actually. They kept in a, in a, in, in a very good uh, status. And we digitized everything. Uh, some of them had problems, but we didn't have to re-digitize for now. We, we have a challenge, actually, in Switzerland. We don't have any, any player anymore. Uh, so, yeah, there is a few ones in France. For now, we, we, we didn't consider re-digitizing things. We digitized six or maybe ten years ago already. Uh, it might come. We have preserved everything. So all the original tapes are preciously kept in the chalet of uh, Claude Nobs. So whenever there are needs in the future, we could do that. But up to now, we, we did not consider this. Thanks very much for your talk. That was just exceptional. Um, I'm curious that a, a lot of institutions, um, especially public ones, digitise in order precisely to make their collections available online because so little can be yep. um, accessed by the public each year. I'm wondering if you've got any thoughts about the fact that, um, I guess, a, a question of whether the constraint that he had about ha not being able to place any of the digitised archive online, has that actually maintained the strength of the festival as a destination and the strength of that experience over time. Uh, we have a lot of discussions around that, effectively. Uh, the festival is wondering how to do you know, currently. Uh, they tried to publish a maximum number of things when they had the 50th birthday in 2016. They opened a web page and uh, we could discover more than 1,000 songs on that. But they had to pay a jurist for one year to get this result, and there is 50,000 songs. So it's very, it's very difficult. Everybody would like to do that. Uh, now it goes more towards some commercial uh, visions, uh, but it's really a kind of brainstorming which is currently happening in Montreux. So I cannot say more. We would like to. It's difficult uh, for, for the, the reason uh, of foundings again. Um, I was just wondering if you've you collect documentation about the mixing sessions in conjunction with the multi-track tapes to recreate the uh, original master, like the final mix. That would be a challenge in itself, I imagine. We don't have that. To, yeah. we, have the, we have every instrument uh, pre-mixing, before the table, before the console. Uh, we have sometimes the, 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 the sheets in, in the tape, but we don't have more information. And especially, we, we are not able to re-build a mix as it was done live by the production team. This is too bad. <laughs> but yeah, we, we, we can do other things. But uh, effectively, this is something that was not kept. And in another range of things, we keep the isolated camera, uh, all the different cameras, for the last 15 years. But before, we don't have them anymore because they were reused uh, the next year uh, to, yeah, to, to avoid spending too much money to buy new ones. And they co were considering that if uh, within one year there was no production uh, asked, it was over. It's too bad. We have a lot of researchers wanting to rebuild concerts from SD, the old SD content. Uh, it's more difficult without those cameras, of course. 
Um, hi, thanks for that. I'm just wondering if you can tell us a little bit about how you tackled rights issues for some of the activities, particularly the remix, the archive and the open mic. Yeah, so in those cases, we have to discuss with the artist. We have the contact, direct contact with the artist to make sure they allow uh, this kind of events, like the, the open mic. And regarding the remix, the archive, I didn't go to the details, but effectively we are not allowed to show any kind of things like this uh, unless we have the discussion with the artist. But there, for the company, uh, we use the concerts inside the festival venue when we can. And for displaying more their, their, their products, we use loops from the web, which are open and uh, free to, to use. This is another uh, side of, uh, of the project. We are blocked again <laughs> by these kind of things, of course. Last night we were talking about innovation and what you can do with all this material, this beautiful material. And you were telling me about Claude Nobs, who was actually uh, well, um, one of the first who came up with things like HD, just like you showed us. And that, that artists actually were triggered by the fact that he used that sort of crisp, beautiful, sharp material because it made them look beautiful as well. Um, Nowadays, with all the technology in place, it's, it's harder, you told me, it's harder to attract these artists simply because, you know, it's, it all looks good anyway. Mm -hmm. um, and and you, you're telling me about new ways to trigger artists to perform at the Jazz Festival, and one of the examples you gave was virtual reality. Yes. Can you tell a bit more about it, how you approached it, and what, what the role is of that new media? Yes, uh, we are at the beginning uh, of VR, I think. Uh, uh, what we did was, the, the, f the first step was to try recording from stage, because it was a new kind of experience to propose to the public. And as you've seen, uh, for some of the artists which are passionate by technology, uh, it could give ideas and and help us having their, their agreement to do things with them and show and display the technology. And effectively, this is the way we think, and at the festival as well, uh, to go to try to propose new things to the artist in order to promote in another way their, their art, uh, which as you just uh, told, uh, Claude did in, with HD in 1991. Uh, so, for the future, uh, we did this live recently. Now we would like to move to another technology, which is light field, uh, where you can really rebuild the whole volume in an image, and you are not stick to the place where we, we have the camera, but people can really move everywhere. So we are not ready to show something, but hopefully within one or two years it would come. And uh, again, maybe it's interesting for the artist. But again, as you, as you say, this is just one way uh, to, to, to help uh, the festival with uh, the, the, new, the new technologies. There are many, many others. And we, we, yeah, we, have, we need to discuss the future of live music as well, socially and with the musicians, with the producers. How will it go? Uh, it's really a, a passion uh, subject for the, for the next uh, years, I think. Thanks, Alain. You're welcome. Big Thank round you. of applause, please. Thank you.